And so moving on, the next speaker is Sarah Hendrickson. Sarah is an MD-PhD at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, the real leader in T-cell biology, as well as an advocate for the pediatric cell atlas work. So go ahead, Sarah. My apologies. Thank you for the opportunity to present our work. I'll be discussing immune dysregulation in pediatric COVID-19 and MIS-C. COVID-19 in children is well appreciated to be generally less symptomatic, but there have been nearly 625,000 pediatric cases diagnosed in the U.S., about 10% of all total U.S. cases. While hospitalization rates are a little more challenging to estimate across the country, between March and July, COVID-Net estimated a cumulative hospitalization rate of 800,000 children, and the state level ranges from 0.2 to 8% of pediatric cases requiring hospitalization. Of the kids admitted, one in three requires ICU level care. PIMS, TS, and MIS-C came on the scene about a month after um, the pandemic started in full force in our country. PIMS, TS was noted in late April by NHS with a alert regarding pediatric patients with a severe Kawasaki disease-like syndrome in the setting of recently proven or suspected SARS-CoV-2. Um, MIS-C was noted about two weeks later by the CDC in the U.S. and with an alert regarding multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children or MIS-C. So what exactly is MIS-C? Per the CDC, it's a pediatric patient with persistent fever, inflammation, hospitalization for severe illness, multi-system organ involvement, and a positive test for SARS-CoV-2, or recent exposure that is very clear. We've had 935 cases so far with a median age of eight, and race and ethnicity is biased towards Hispanic and non-Hispanic Blacks, um, with an increase in obese uh, patients and a mortality of approximately 1.8%. The timing of MIS-C is fascinating with regards to the mechanism. As we watched SARS-CoV-2 PCR positivity increase in April in this recent New England Journal review, we saw that there's about a four week delay to the MIS-C peak. A couple pieces of evidence that this could be a late stage complication of viral infection. In our own cohort, when we looked at the cycle threshold in MIS-C patients who were PCR positive versus severe COVID-19 patients, there's a higher cycle threshold consistent with less virus being present. And if we look at the development of spike protein-specific IgG, again, we're comparing severe COVID-19 with MIS-C patients, we see an increase tighter in our MIS-C patients. So those, these are consistent with a longer time since infection. There's still a lot of work to be done on the etiology of MIS-C. Our COVID-19 research team at CHOP and Penn combines our dysregulated immune response team, which is a multidisciplinary clinical and research team. Um, in addition to our usual work, we are coordinating the COVID-19 biobank and multi-studies, multimodal studies are run on each of our recruited patients. The work I'll be presenting is a collaboration between human immunology labs at CHOP and at Penn and the DIRT team. Um, this paper that I'll be discussing was posted over the weekend on that archive um, and is the work of many, many groups in a team science approach. So we were immunophenotyping our patients along the way. So we were collecting blood from our pediatric patients in April through June 2020. In concert, um, Penn adult patients were also being collected using the same processing, the same staining, and the same flow parameters. We collected um, 16 total pediatric COVID-19 patients, 14 total MIS-C patients using lymphocyte flow cytometry and whole blood flow cytometry on fresh blood. This meant that it was not possible to compare to healthy kids because it was not possible to recruit healthy kids at that time. All of our MIS-C patients had SARS-CoV-2 spike protein IgG that developed. First, we'll look at the lymphocyte balance in our MIS-C versus our COVID-19 children. I wanna go through this figure. Gray are the adult healthy donors. The different shades of pink to purple are different severities increasing with darker color of adult COVID patients. Light blue is pediatric COVID that was not ARDS, less severe. Dark blue is the more severe ARDS patients. And green triangles are MIS-C. So here you can see our B cells are elevated in our MIS-C versus our pediatric COVID-19. And our T cells across the board, both fours and eights, are decreased compared to the pediatric COVID patients in MIS-C. This is actually quite similar to the most severe adult COVID patients. In the future, comparison with pediatric healthy controls will be informative, but as for this paper, we relied on a comparison both within the two pediatric affected groups and then the adult groups as well because of this and because we know that pediatric patients have a higher fraction of naive cells, we're exclusively going to focus on the non-naive cells in our future comparisons here of uh, T cell activation. So as we look at hyperactivation in CD4 and CD8 T cells, CD4 non-naive on top, CD8 non-naive on bottom, showing flow cytometry plots here of CD38 and HLA-DR, these two markers together are markers of recently activated T cells. And you can see here that in our CD4s and our CD8s, we have increased rates of these cells in our MIS-C patients compared to our COVID-19 pediatric patients. And the rates in MIS-C look a lot like our severe adults. 
When we step further into hyperactivation of our CD8 T cells, we look at the expression of PD-1 on our non-naive CD8s. Here you can see we have a significant upregulation in MIS-C compared to pediatric COVID-19 and similar to severe adult COVID-19. Now PD-1 can be upregulated in initial phases of our immune response, as well as in the setting of a chronic exposure to antigen and inflammation. By adding additional markers, and here I'm showing just a slice of our data using CD39 as a second marker, the co-expression of PD-1 and CD39 is also elevated in our non-naive CD8s in our MIS-C children, again, similar to our very severely affected adult COVID patients. The expression of PD-1 and CD39 together has been associated with exhaustion, um, which is again, the, the um, poor function that we can see in the setting of an immune system that's been exposed to chronic activation with both antigen and inflammation present over time. So while this is consistent with chronic antigen exposure, there are many much, much work needs to be done to understand the cause and effect of the immune dysregulation we're seeing in these patients while acutely ill. What can we learn more about MIS-C from the similarities it has to Kawasaki disease? So the initial reports were that there was a Kawasaki disease-like phenomenon. This is a medium vessel arteritis of children. Its diagnosis requires five or more days of fever and at least four of the following five um, symptoms, including rash, cervical lymphopathy, and changes in the conjunctiva, oral mucosa, and peripheral extremities. The cardiovascular complications that can be seen in this disease include coronary artery dilation, but much less often shock or poor myocardial function, which is more of what we see in our MIS-C patients. But if we focus on the vessels, on the vasculature, and we think about how T cells could interplay with that realm, there have been recent publications focusing on CDA positive, CX3, CR1, or fractal kind positive CD8 non-naive T cells. These have been highlighted as being vascular patrolling cells. So yes, of course, our naive and effector cells do, do patrol our blood vessels as well as our lymphatics. But the idea of these cells is that they are preferentially retained in the vasculature. When we looked in our MIS-C and our pediatric COVID-19 patients, there was no difference in frequency between these two different CD8 positive populations. However, and this is a little bit complicated, so I will take a moment to explain this figure. If we split apart our CX3CR1 negative and our CX3CR1 positive non-naive CD8s, the activation I told you about before that we see in our MIS-C patients predominantly lives within the CX3CR1 positive cells. And overall, we see an increased frequency of activated CX3CR1 positive CD8 T cells. Now, what's fascinating about this is that these uh, vascular patrol cells that are all differently activated in our MIS-C patients, the level that they are present in the blood is correlated with vascular complications, both labs, so the maximum D-dimer, the minimum platelets, as well as the overall need for vasoactives, um, goes along with the level of these cells. When we turn to adults who do not have MIS-C as a diagnosis that they can receive, but can have thrombotic complications, this same cell subset is increased in frequency in patients who have thrombotic complications in adult COVID-19. So there seems to be a connection worth deepening our understanding of between these fractal kind positive CD8 T cells and COVID-19 disease more broadly. If we think about the immune landscape in COVID-19 and MIS-C generally, both in adults and in kids, here taking all the patients we've recruited, and all 207 variables we have to consider, and then using an algorithm to reduce that down to two dimensions, here using an UMF algorithm, each dot here is a single person. And the idea of the algorithm is to reduce these 207 dimensions down to two dimensions that we can consider. And to do that, they try to put together the individual people next to the people who are most similar to them across as many variables as possible. Here you see the adult healthy donors are off to the left, and the MIS-C patients and pediatric COVID-19 patients overlay with the adult COVID-19 patients. Interestingly, our severe pediatric patients and MIS-C patients overlay most often with the severe adult patients. And if we look at how this changes over time, our less sick pediatric patients in light blue, here showing CD8 non-naive T cells and various hyperactivated populations, they don't have much opportunity for longitudinal sampling. Our ARDS patients are quite sick and safe for weeks. These patients don't really show improvement in these populations. But our MIS-C patients who do show longitudinal sampling do improve in these populations as their inflammatory markers on the right and their um, ALC and platelets improve in concert. As we look forward, it's really important as an immune care, my apologies, as a primary immune deficiency researcher and clinician to note that when we see patients who generally do very well with an infection, like our pediatric patients generally, becoming incredibly sick or having an unusual complication like MIS-C, it's really important to think about the genetic underpinning. And we're, we are collaborating with COVID-HGE to run whole genome studies on our patients. It's also really important to note that we're only seeing acute sick samples. It's gonna be really important in the future to look at pediatric healthy samples and recovered samples from our sick children at their new baseline as comparators. 
Mechanistic studies are going to step forward from this immune profiling data to highlight the key subsets and pathways for our single cell work, as well as additional serum studies in the future. And I'd like to thank my lab, the CHOP dysregulated immune response team across many groups, the many groups at Penn, including the Wary Lab and the Betts Lab, and COVID HGE for the work that we're doing together and that Dr. Castanova will talk about in detail later, and of course the families that collaborated in our studies. Thank you.